Today we are going to continue on our journey with preparing ourselves for revival that the Lord has given us. But we have to, in order for us to reap the harvest that he's given us, in order for us to not just reap it, but to be able to retain and, you know, do something with the harvest and not just let it waste even after we've got it off of the vine. Sometimes you can bring it into the house, but uh, Brother Benny, if you don't process it and do what it takes to preserve it, it'll run right there on your kitchen table. So we can bring the harvest in, and we can get excited about bringing in the harvest. We can get excited about people getting the Holy Ghost and getting baptized in Jesus' name. But if we don't do what we have to do to preserve them, they're just going to kind of waste. It's going to kind of die, and they're not going to really fulfill their purpose. And they're not going to be nourishment to the body whenever it comes time for them to be nourishment to the body. Amen? Amen. So today we're going to talk about flesh versus spirit. Flesh versus spirit. Second Chronicles 32, 7 through 8 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria. You can just kind of put in there if you want to to make it your own. Just do not be afraid or dismayed before the enemy, the devil, that thing whatever it is in your life that's trying to put fear in your heart that's trying to make you dismayed and bewildered and confused and just overwhelmed he says nor before all the multitude that is with him in other words look it doesn't matter how bad it looks you've got this big thing that you're seeing and then you're seeing all these other things with it that's kind of scary and it's kind of Throwing you into a place to where you're afraid and you're dismayed and you're overwhelmed. He said, for there are more with us than there are with him. The problem is, is we don't always see what's with us because we're too busy looking at what's coming against us. He says, with him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us to do to fight our battles and the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah the king of Judah so I want to talk about today the flesh versus the spirit I want to try to help us today <clears throat> because we cannot help people and we cannot help a harvest if we ourselves are running around with fear and bewilderment and dismay and just doubt and fear and we're crumbling and we're we're not stable we're not strong we're not we're not able to stand whenever the storms of life are raging I'm not and I'm not I want you to understand I'm not beating us up today I'm trying to help us today I'm talking even myself we've got to get to a place to where no matter what comes no matter what goes we're going to stand on the word of God and we're going to know that God, it doesn't matter how dark it looks right now. I know you're with me. Your word says that you are with me. Your word says that greater is he that's with me than he that's coming against me. Your word says that there's more for me than there are that are coming against me. We're talking about flesh versus the spirit. Too many times we tend to listen to the voice of the flesh and not the spirit. And that's what gets us in our places of despair. Now in this verse of scripture that I was reading to you just now, this is leading up to, it's talking about Sennacherib. That's quite a name. Every time I say it, I can't help but think about a Snickers. I'm not sure why, but all I can see is a snicker when I say Sennacherib. And then I think about ribs. A snicker and ribs is what I'm thinking about right now. I'm going to eat the ribs, Brother Danny, and not the snicker. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was invaded. They invaded Judah during the reign of Hezekiah. And this is where the scripture that we were just reading was talking about. And before their enemies could reach Jerusalem, the king, Hezekiah, consulted with his military leaders. And they took steps to prevent the destruction of Jerusalem. And when they had done all that they could do, Hezekiah began to encourage the people with the following words. And this is verse 7 that we just read. He says, for there are more with us than there are with him. Now we need to get that. We need to get that in our spirit. There are more with us than there are with him. Who is him? No, come on. There's more with us than there are with him. Who's the him we're talking about? The enemy, the devil. Look at your neighbor and says, there's more with us. And say, then against us. These words sound a lot like John's words to the early church in 1 John 4 and 4 when he says, You are of God, little children. And you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, I understand these are great cliché verses. And we like to quote them. Oh, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And when you're trying to encourage somebody else, you know, we rip all these scriptures out and we can quote them like nobody's business and we can give them all the encouragement in the world. But when it's us, all of a sudden we get amnesia and we don't know anything. And we forget all the promises in the book of God that come for us it's not just for your brother or your sister, but it's for you as well. Right? Now, further, Hezekiah reminded the people of Jerusalem in 2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8. Uh, he says, with, uh, verse 8, he says, With him as an arm of flesh. In other words, with him, all they can do is what they can do in the flesh. They're limited. All they can do is what they can do on their own ability. That's all they can do against you. That's all they can do to, to hurt you is what they can do on their own ability. He says, but with us is the Lord our God. Now, if God can do all things, if God can do the impossible if God can dry up a Red Sea and hold, the wall, hold it up where there's walls of water on both sides. Now, I want you to get a picture of this because there, I think there was over a million people that, from what history records, over a million people with the children of Israel had to walk across that Red Sea. And it was dry. It didn't say it was muddy ground. It said they walked across on dry ground. And there was walls on both sides of them. I want you to get a picture of that. You talk about an aquarium. That had to be an incredible sight to be walking by. And you've got walls of water on both sides. And you see the fish. And you see the things in the water. But it, it's not coming to you. It's not touching you. It's just standing there. It's just suspended as you walk across, one million plus people, imagine it took a while, for them to get to the other side, and it's, you know, I'm talking about the power of the God that we serve. And as soon as the last foot stepped on the other side of that river, and somewhere along there, Pharaoh and his army was already in, in the middle of this Red Sea. And those walls of water came down and it drowned the enemy. And the word of God said, you see those Egyptians that are coming after you? You see that devil? You see that past? You see those things that remind you of the oppression and the depression and the, 
and the life of a slave. You see all of these things? Get a good look at them right now because after today, you're not going to see them anymore. They're not going to bother you anymore. They're not going to torment you anymore. You're going to be set free from that. Somebody needs to get a hold of that today. We're too busy still looking at this. You need to let it get washed under the blood of Jesus Christ and leave it there. Don't try to pull it back out every time something comes against you and then pull it. But let's dig up. Let me dig around in this blood. Let me see. There were some things that that kind of held me back and I'm feeling a little down today and I'm going to remind myself of all these terrible things and all these bad things and all. No, we need to leave it where it's at. You need to remind the enemy of his future. He says, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. The problem is we're trying to fight our own battles. We've been leaning on the arm of flesh instead of leaning on the arm of the spirit. We're talking about flesh versus spirit. When we become born again, when we become children of God, we no longer, and I'm getting ahead of myself, we no longer do things the way we used to do things. Now, before you were filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in his name, you may have fought battles in a different way. But when we are born again and we have the spirit of God in us, we no longer depend on our own flesh to fight any battle, any battle that would come against us. I don't care what it is. Whatever that battle looks like in your life, whether it's people, whether it's sickness, whether it's oppression, whether it's finances, whatever that battle looks like to you, only you know what it is. We do not fight it in the flesh. Because when we try to fight it in the flesh, we're only going to get the results that the flesh can bring. But I want to fight my battles in the spirit. Because God can do more for me in the spirit if I will lean on the spirit more than the arm of flesh than my flesh could ever do for me. Amen? And... 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. You want to know how you pull down some strongholds in your life? You want to know how you pull down some things that have exalted themselves? above God, whether it's in your life, whether it's in your children's life. I'm going to tell you, we can pray prayers for our children. Don't have to just be what's going on with us. But I'm going to tell you, when you start seeing things going on in your family. Situations that are around you that affect you. We handle that in the spirit. We do warfare in the spirit. The Christians are limited in what we can physically do in the spiritual battle. But we are assured that the battle is not really ours. Second Chronicles 20 and 15, he said, and he said, listen, all of you, Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. I want you to hear that for yourself today. This is what God is saying to us. Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord. The battle is not yours. So quit fighting it like it is yours. It belongs to the Lord. The people who depend on the arm of flesh will be sadly lacking in this spiritual battle. If we depend on the arm of flesh, then we're going to be disappointed in our spiritual walk. So let's talk about spiritual warfare. It would be a grave mistake to underestimate what each Christian faces in today's modern society. Right? From the beginning of time, Satan has ordered his forces against the power of God. It's nothing new. 
It's nothing new that he's coming against the children of God or the people of God. It's been happening from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden. Actually, it started happening in heaven. When he tried to exalt himself instead of God. So this is nothing new. There are daily spiritual assaults that come against a person's soul. And some of us can say amen to that because we feel those assaults that come against us every day. It was once said this, a Christian's life is like a battleground and not a playground. Can anybody attest to that? It is God's will that every individual in this spiritual battle be victorious. It is the will of God that we are victorious. It is not the will of God for us to be struggling. It is not the will of God for us to be on our last leg. It is not the will of God for us to be barely making it. That is not the will of God for us. It is essential for us to recognize the significance of this spiritual conflict. There are three things that Christians are faced with as enemies. And they are this. The first one is the world. The second one is the flesh. And the third one is the devil. The world is the system that is contrary to God and that caters to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The enemy of this world is the fact that it tries to lure us to be more like it and less like God. We fight the lust of our flesh every single day. We live in this world, but the Bible tells us to not live of the world. You can be in the world, but don't be of it. You got to live here. We understand we have to live here, but we should not look like the world, nor should we be desiring to be, look as close to the world as we can and still profess to be a born again Christian and believer. I, I, I want to be able to walk in any place and somebody identify me as a Christian, as a child of God, because there's nothing that of me that looks like the world. Not just look, but my attitude, my spirit. I mean, I can have all this together, but if my spirit is nasty and ugly and self-righteous, then really I'm not, I'm not showing anything that says Christ in me. A lot of times we, we're so concerned about how we look on the outward appearance that we forget to take care of this inner man. My Bible tells me that if I take care of what's on the inside, it's going to show up on the outside. If I desire to be more like him, there's going to be some changes that happen in my life. The problem is, too often our desire to be more like him isn't as strong as it should be. I don't want to live my walk with God in the manner that I, I want to say, okay, God, what, what, is, the, what is the least, what's, where is that line that I can just kind of walk this line okay, and just be, you know, I, I, I can make it in if I'm just, if I'm right here. I mean, what, is, what, is, what can I do that, that's just the basic? What do I basically, just the basics that I have to do just to secure me a spot in heaven. I don't, I don't want to live my walk with God like that. He says he, he, he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. And he says, I'm not going to share my glory with anybody. And if we are his, he wants to know we're his. Give you a little analogy. This is my husband. I love him. And he should be the only man in my life that I say things to, certain things to, that I show affection to, that I want to please, that I, I should not be concerned about pleasing anybody else in certain manners other than my husband. I should be concerned about the things that I do and how they affect or reflect on my husband. I should not be living any kind of way that would bring shame to him or a reproach to him. 
as the, as the woman of God that God put him with, as the spiritual mother of this church, it's not just his responsibility to be a godly man. And then I can just live however I want to live. Because I'm going to tell you, we can say what we want to say, but it matters. If I was not to live a holy and separated life, I can promise you people would look at him a little bit differently and judge him by well, what kind of priest is he at his home? He can't even keep his wife under submission. He can't even, I mean, she's not even living things that he's preaching and teaching. How in the world does he expect people to follow after him? And listen to the words he's saying if he can't even control what's in his house. So when we're living for God, if we say we're his children, we're his bride. I'm the bride of Christ, right? If I am the bride of Christ, then what I do should only bring him glory. It should never be a reproach to him. It should never be anything that would bring him shame. It should never be anything that he would look down at me and say, oh, mm, that's not me that I see there. We're talking about the flesh versus the spirit. If we are going to be a strong church that will reap the harvest and not just reap the harvest, but preserve the harvest that God has given us, we have got to be full of the spirit and not the flesh. So the first enemy is the world. And the things that it will pull at us. And try to entice us with. We have to fight against the lust of this flesh. The second enemy is our flesh. The flesh is the old nature that mankind inherited from Adam. That's why Paul said, I have to die daily. Because this flesh, I have to live in the flesh. We've got to live in this fleshly body that God gave us. But if we are going to walk in the spirit, we've got to crucify that flesh every day. And for me, there's times that it's every minute that I'm having to crucify my flesh. Because I can get up in the morning, Sister Diane, and read my word and pray and have a time of devotion with the Lord. And an hour later, something happened and this old flesh wants to come alive. And The third enemy that we have is the devil. That's pretty, that's pretty I think, obvious. And we know, we know who the devil is, right? Lucifer, he is a fallen angel. And it is his mission to destroy every relationship that God's creation has with him. He is not happy about this relationship that we have with Christ. Because he messed his up. And he cannot fix it. There's nothing he can do to fix what he has done. He is destined for a life, an eternity of fire. And he's doing everything he can to bring as many people with him. Anybody ever know people like that in your life? They're not happy and they're going to make sure nobody else is happy. And they're going to do everything they can to make everybody miserable with them. You know, you know people like that? I know some people like that. That's how the enemy is. That's how the devil is. He's not happy and he wants everybody else to be unhappy. His life is going to be destroyed and he wants to try to destroy everybody else's life. That's his mission. So we have to recognize our enemy. The believer likewise should know his enemy and should not be caught off guard. We have to know him. We, the same way we talked about uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about how can we be Christ-like if we don't know Christ. We have to know him. We have to know everything about him. We have to know his attributes. We have to know what the things that he desires. We have to know his passions. We have to know his loves. We have to know the things that makes him happy. If we're going to be like him, we've got to know him. And if we're going to fight our enemy, 
We've got to know the enemy. We've got to know what he's about. We've got to know his tactics. We've got to know his angles. We've got to know what he's going to try to do to trip us up. A good warrior is prepared for the enemy that they're fixing a fight. He knows everything about them. And we've got to know our enemy. We cannot be caught off guard. When David faced Goliath, he not only faced a big man, but he faced the opposing forces of evil. I want to say this real quick. It's not in my notes, but I just felt it in my spirit really fast. Talking about the enemy, knowing our enemy so we're not caught off guard. We've got to be careful what we entangle ourselves with. Because it may seem innocent. But then before you know it, all of a sudden you find yourself, oh my God, how did I get here? What happened? How did this happen? I'm, I'm just going to say this and I'll move on. I, I know personal people that decided some of our holiness standards were not really necessary. It really isn't that necessary. So they kind of started letting, you know, kind of letting those things down out of their life. And, and they were still going to church. You know, I'm still going to go to church. I still, you know, whatever, believe. And, but I just don't feel like some of these things are necessary. So letting down this guard and letting down that guard. And, and, and then before you know it, all of a sudden they're, they're kind of partaking of things of the world, such as drinking and partying and going to clubs and listening to music that not, has nothing to do with God. And, and they found themselves now having affairs, divorced, three kids, now we're divorced. And how did that happen? How did that happen? Because somewhere along the line, you got a little careless and you decided, yeah, you know what? That's not really that important. That's not that important. This don't really hurt you. This is not really going to matter if I do that. It's not, I mean, really, how can that hurt me? Well, now we know. We got to be very careful what we decide is really not important. And quit looking for reasons or quit looking for things that we can try to cut out. I, that's not what I'm interested in in my walk with God. I, I, I'm going to tell you what I am interested in. God, what, what more can I do that I'm not doing now? Because I cannot afford. Eternity is a long time. And there is nothing in this world that I would ever give up or sacrifice that is worth me losing my soul over. I want to be as close to him as I possibly can. I want to be more like him as I possibly can. I want to bring him joy and pleasure. My whole life is centered around pleasing him. Nobody else but him. And you know what happens when I please him? When I am pleasing to him, I'm pleasing to my husband. I'm pleasing to my children. I'm pleasing to my church family. Because if I am pleasing him... Every other relationship is going to be where it needs to be. Goliath asked for a man to fight for Israel. In 1 Samuel 17 and 10 it says, And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day, so give me a man that we may fight together. Satan wants to keep the battle at the level of a man on the arm of flesh. That's where the enemy wants to keep it. He wants to keep it between you and him on the flesh level. But David responded a little bit differently. In 1 Samuel 17, 45, he says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear. These are all fleshly objects. And with a javelin. Things that the flesh can do. Weapons that the flesh can use. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now, all he's coming to him again with is the, a word. But it's the word of God. He said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I want to remind us how powerful our words are. I want to remind us that if we begin to speak things, they happen. So David began to prophesy and he said, 
He said, this day, the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I will take your head from you. And this day I will give you, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He prophesied what was going to happen. That was his weapon. And what do you think happened? Exactly what he prophesied happened. I'm trying to make us understand we need to quit leaning so much on the flesh and trying to fix things and fight things in the flesh and begin to get in the spirit and start speaking and prophesying things that need to happen through the spirit. Leaning on the word of God, leaning on the power and the authority that God has put in us by his spirit. We need to understand our enemy. Goliath wanted more than David's life. He wanted the place, he wanted to place the whole nation of Israel in the state of submission to him. The enemy wants more than just you. He's not just satisfied with you. He wants your whole family. He wants the whole community. He's not just satisfied with, oh, if I can just get Brother Benny, then I'm good. I'll, I'll stop there. I'll just stop at him. No. He, he's going for the whole nation. See, if he can keep you busy fighting the phantoms in your mind, there is nothing more that he needs to do. You want to know where, where the biggest battle that we face today in our world is in the minds of people. I'm telling you, I have never in my life seen so many battles that people fight in their mind, anxiety, fear, depression, oppression. That's all in the mind. It all comes from the mind, just the devil tormenting people's minds. And he, he grips fear in their heart because their mind starts thinking these things. And, and they start processing things and they obsess over things. And they, they get themselves in a place to where they are overwhelmed with fear and anxiety and they can't even function. So what do they do? They get put on medication. We have a world that is medicated trying to get rid of a spiritual problem. It's not going to happen. We cannot fight things in the spirit with the flesh. If we're going to fight it and conquer it and overcome it, it's going to be through the spirit, not through the flesh. I'm trying to hurry. But in contrast, David wanted more than Goliath's head. He wanted victory for the name of the Lord. And we should want the same today. The victory should not be for our own glory the victory that we are seeking and trying to pursue should not be for our, for our own gratifications and, and, you know, just exalting ourselves. Look what we did. We won. Yay for me. It should be for the glory of God. Because David said, I want to read to you the last part of that scripture. He says, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, when you're seeking for the Lord to fight your battle and you're praying in the spirit about things in, in your life that need to be conquered. We need to make sure when all is said and done and it's been conquered that God receives the glory and not us. We need to make sure that we give him the glory for what's happened and not the counselor or the medications or the doctors, or the lawyers, or the physicians. We need to make sure that God gets the glory. Amen? Ultimately, we must recognize that our battle is at a higher level than flesh. Ephesians 6 and 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, and the heavenly places. That's what we're fighting against. So we have to be equipped. And God equips us. Or he gives us what we need to be equipped. Our power first of all comes from where? God. We must let go of our fleshly weapons. And pick up our spiritual weapons. If we want to have victory. 
if we want to have a victory that lasts. We can fight a battle in the flesh and we might seem like we've won it, but then all of a sudden it comes back and we're having to face it all over again because it was never conquered and defeated in the spirit. We do not fight our battles like the world fights them. Now before Christ, you may have handled things differently. You may have fought your battles in a different way. But after Christ... We should not be fighting our battles the same way we did before we were filled with the Spirit of God. Because we will never win this battle trying to fight the things of the Spirit and the flesh. We are no longer children of the flesh, but we are now children of the Spirit. So as children of the Spirit, we must fight our battles in the Spirit. Amen? Now, God provides us with an armor. And listen, we've... we've We've put this armor on so many times in teaching, my Lord. We've talked about it many times. But we're going to talk about it again today because apparently sometimes we forget that we have to put the armor of God on every day to fight our battle. Listen, we're warriors. We're not in a break right now. We're in the heat of the battle right now. And the problem is, is too many of us are sitting down acting like we're, we're not in war. We are in war. We are at war with our enemy. More so now than we've ever been. It's a fight for our soul. Intense fight for our soul. He knows his time is short and he's throwing everything he can at us. To distract us. To get us off guard to to catch us with our weapons laying against something with our armor halfway on we may have a little bit on but we don't have the whole armor on and so we got that helmet off and he's coming to our mind we've got that that breastplate off and he's hitting us in our heart Ephesians 6 13 through 17 it says therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Are we living in an evil day? And having done all to stand. So when you've done all that you know to do in the flesh. He said you got to put on this armor. And you got to just stand. He said stand therefore having girded your waist with the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Too often we're trying to fight those fiery darts with our mouth. We're trying to defend ourselves with our own words. And he said, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I'm going to tell you what I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And I've read this scripture, I can't even tell you how many times. But when I began to go and in, get into this lesson, and, and when that's, that's scripture right there, he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's your weapon. Not our words. Because when we start using our own words to fight the battle, all we do is make a bigger mess and cause more problems and make it worse than it would have been if we would have just held our peace, got the word of God, and begin to speak the word of God, begin to pray the word of God. When he talks about the sword, he's not talking about a literal sword. And too many, we, too many times we take out a real sword and we begin to just want to start slicing and dicing and cutting up people and just... That's right, Pastor. Whenever they come to take him out of the garden and bring him to be beaten, Peter was going to fight it in the flesh. He took out that sword and he cut the ear off of that soldier. And the Lord looked at him and says, you, 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 you want to fight in the flesh? You're going to fight it with that sword of the flesh? You're going to die by that sword of the flesh. But you've got to fight in the spirit. 
And he reached down and picked up the ear and put it back on the man. I'm telling you, I, 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 we're try, we got to prepare ourselves for the revival that God is bringing us. But we cannot do it if we're operating in the flesh. All of these weapons are defensive weapons. This armor was not meant to be worn while cowering down in a corner. But this armor was given to protect us in battle. Not only must we ha put on our defensive armor, but we must pick up our offensive weapons. Ephesians 6 and 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We are instructed to go forth with the sword of the Spirit and to pray in the Spirit. We are never more powerful than when we get in the Spirit and begin to pray in the Spirit. You know what the Word of God tells us? That sometimes we don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray, Sister Frankie. Sometimes in situations that I'm going through, and the flesh may want to get involved and pray things that I want to pray in the flesh. But if I can get myself in the Spirit, the Bible tells me, that the Spirit will begin to pray and do intercession because the Spirit knows what needs to be prayed. I don't know what needs to be prayed. My flesh gets involved and wants to pray things that it doesn't need to pray. But the Word of God tells me you got to get in the Spirit because the Spirit knows what to pray. And there again, we're trusting on the arm of our flesh rather than the arm of the Spirit. <clears throat> Romans 8 and 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You ever heard sometimes in prayer, you got people that are just groaning and wailing, and you're like, they're not even saying anything. They might not be, but I'm going to tell you what, they're doing some powerful things in the Spirit. There's some powerful things happening in the spirit realm. You don't always have to be understanding your words and what you're saying. But if you can get in the spirit and let the spirit begin to groan and utter and speak. God is fighting your battle for you in the spirit. That's why we don't need to be afraid whenever the spirit language wants to take over in us. We don't need to be afraid to get lost in the spirit and let the spirit begin to pray. We need more now than ever. We need to be getting in the spirit and letting the spirit pray through us. You see, Satan cannot stop or stand up to the word of God. Or the Spirit of God. When we begin to pray in the Spirit, He does not understand a word we're saying, Sister Mary. He cannot interfere with what's happening because He's standing there. He's like, what's going on right now? What's going on? I don't understand nothing she's praying right now. Uh, it's making me nervous because I, I can't do anything about what she's praying right now. She's locked in somewhere. I can't even get through in her mind right now because she's, she's in a place that I cannot get to. He cannot go where the Spirit of God is. My Lord, that's powerful. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying right now, but if we could ever get our place, listen, whenever things start beating against you and we don't need to go find a corner and cower down and cry and say, oh God, I can't believe this is happening. Why are you? We need to find us a place and start doing war in the spirit because we are not weak little people. We are mighty he says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not of this flesh, they're not of this world, but they are mighty through God and pulling down the strongholds that come against us. He's given us everything we need. The problem is, is we're not doing what we should do in the spirit to fight the battles that we are coming up against. That's why we're so weary. That's why we're so wore out. That's why we're so tired. That's why we come in here so heavy. Because we're fighting things in the spirit in our flesh. And God is trying to wake us up today and says, listen, you're not of the flesh. You're of the spirit. And you need to quit trying to go back to that fleshly side of you. And you need to get in the spirit. And you need to square up your shoulders. And you need to start doing warfare. Because these things that are coming against you, they're nothing in my presence. They're nothing whenever you put me in the mix of it. They're nothing. 
When David looked at Goliath in the flesh, he was a big man. It seemed impossible. You got a little bitty boy out there fixing to do a man's job. And you got this big old giant that's laughing at him. He's making fun of him. David could have been intimidated, Brother Pepper, and could have said, Oh, you know what? I can't do it. I'm scared. I'm going to go. No. You know what he said? That's all right. He even told Saul, he says, I can't put that armor on you. Give me, it's too heavy. It don't fit right. He got him five little stones and a slingshot. But that's not what killed the giant. It was the word of God that killed the giant. Because when he let that rock go, he spoke it. He had already spoke the word and what was going to happen before he released a, a stone. And he prophesied what was going to happen. I'm telling you, pastor preached not too long ago, prophesy. It's never too late. We got to get these things in our spirit. We cannot just keep coming and hearing words that God is putting in us and speaking to us and trying to equip us and trying to tell us. And we hear it and we go home and we forget and we don't apply it. We don't use it. We don't do it. We can hear a million sermons and lessons, but until we start getting it in our spirit and begin to act upon what God is speaking to us and what God is telling us, we're not going to see any changes in our situations. But when we get it in our spirit and we start speaking some things and acting upon what we're hearing, I'm telling you, I prophesy to you today. You start doing what the Word of God is telling us, and you're going to see a change and a shift in what's going on in your life. In Jesus' name, we got to stand. i got to shut up. Let's stand. It's 1020. I'll pick this back up next Sunday. No, I won't, because we're having one service. I'll pick it back up whenever we come back. We are children of the Spirit. We've been born again. We're not of the flesh. Quit walking in the flesh. Quit operating in the flesh. Quit thinking like the flesh. Quit speaking like the flesh. It's time that we get our minds saturated with the Spirit and the Word of God. So that everything we speak is in the Spirit. Everything we do, it's in the spirit. Our actions, our words, the spirit. We've got to be consumed with the spirit of God. That is the only way we're going to make it in this end time. It's the only way we're going to see the revival and the harvest preserved in this church is when we learn how to walk in the spirit continuously. In Jesus' name, every hand lifted up. Let's just begin to talk to the Lord. <clears throat> God, I pray that you would crucify this flesh. Help us to deny this flesh every day. You spoke to us last week about denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following you, not with a half heart, not with a piece of our heart. God, I pray that you would take the love of this world out of our mouth. Take it out of our heart. There's too many. We're too divided in so many areas in our spirit, God. And we're not completely sold out 100% with our heart, with our mind, with our passions. I pray, God, that you would get the love and the lust of this world out of us. And I pray that you would consume us with the love and the passion and the desires for the things of God and for the spirit, O oh Lord. You desire to use this church in such a mighty way. And I pray, God, that we would align ourselves with you so that you will fulfill your purpose and your plan for this church body. I don't want it to be passed on to another church because you couldn't trust us with it, because we were too carnal, because we were too fleshly. But, God, I want us to be consumed with your spirit so that we can have the revival that you desire to give this church and this community.
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, God. Help us. Help us, Lord. I pray that you would take the scales off of our eyes and you would let us see ourselves the way that you see us. Help us to see what needs to be changed in every one of us so that we can be in alignment with you, so that we can be the church that is lined up with the bride and with the groom, God, that you would fulfill your plan in this day, in this hour, in this church. In the name of Jesus, we ask it, Lord. And everybody said amen.